This is Women Who Build Empires, a podcast celebrating women entrepreneurs and thought leaders who are turning the tables on outdated old school belief systems and building business empires that align with who they are, how they work, and how they are leaving a lasting legacy. And I'm your host, Emmy Kirshner, serial entrepreneur, investor, and business consultant for ambitious women entrepreneurs who are boldly taking their business to the next level. In each episode, you're going to get to know the women who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of how both success and failure have helped them become incredible CEOs. Hello, Empresses. I am beyond excited to share Alejandra Santos' story with you today. She is the founder and CEO of Startup Tandem, a company that helps high-performing organizations position their financials for an exit, and continuously mentors teams to help promote and maintain ethical practices for growth. And this year alone, Alejandra and our team have helped raise 10 plus million in funding. Pretty impressive. And I truly believe that some of the characteristics every entrepreneur needs is boldness and a courageousness to jump in and be uncomfortable, but Alejandra's story definitely takes the cake for me. We talk about her leaving Honduras at the age of 17 without telling her family, and very shortly after, her mom had died because she knew that coming to Miami was the way that she was going to be able to start realizing her dream. And we talk about how she has moved from there and then built this incredible business, including some of the common mistakes that entrepreneurs make and how to avoid going broke fast. I hope you are as inspired by Alejandro as I am. Alejandra, welcome. I have been looking forward to our conversation all day. You are doing some incredible things with your business and your backstory fascinates me. So I can hardly wait to hear it, but share with everybody just who you are a little bit and a little short intro, and we can dive into my very long list of questions. <laughs> no, thank you, Emmy, first of all, for having me in your platform, in your show, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. So yeah, a little bit about myself. I'm from Honduras. I came here at the age of 17 when my mother died at the age of 16, kind of like my world turned upside down, right? So I decided to move to America to pursue a different life, a different career. And since then, I've been doing everything on my own. I put myself through school, college, and different degrees. I had a degree in finance. I had a degree in accounting. I did an MBA just recently right now. I'm continuing to study along the way just because I'm a really nerd at heart. I love learning. (laughs) So... (laughs) And I created this business, yes, because I've been in the consulting industry for a long time. Ever since the economy crashed back in 2008, I kind of went ahead and took a turn into consulting. And I did it for many big companies, CPA firms, you know, private other companies that target and serve industries like restaurants, retail, startups, Mm -hmm. nonprofits, schools. So a lot of variety of different industries. So I've been doing this for quite some time. And one day I decided to create this company because I've been, I am a very passionate person to, you know, help entrepreneurs create a successful business without having to go through billable hours or, you know, spending a lot of unnecessary money on a service that is not that expensive. So that's my whole purpose with this company is be very value focused with the services that we serve serve our clients with and all of them, HR, tax, accounting, CFO, and all of them that we have already in the company established. That's that's our main focus, valuable services. I can't really wait to dive into that more. What what was it like having your mom pass at 16? Like, oh, it was unfathomable yeah. to me. Yeah, no, that was the war. I think I definitely know that is the worst day of my life. I still remember like it was yesterday. I was actually graduating from high school that day. And that day I got the news. Well, I didn't even get the news that day. It was awful. I was in another city in the country and they just placed me on a bus because she was very sick. 
they said, and she was already dead. So through my whole trip on the bus, thinking, you know, I'm going to go see my mom that is really sick in the hospital. I was getting all these messages from classmates saying, I'm so sorry, Alejandra. And I'm like, why are they guys sorry about? Like, why are you saying sorry to me? I'm going to go see my mom. She's fine. And then I, you know, got out of the bus stop and literally took me to the, they took me to the funeral home where she was already. And I didn't even know. So I basically... As soon as I saw the funeral home, I like threw myself from the car. I think I jumped out of the car when the car was moving. And, you know, it was just very shocking for me. My family couldn't tell me. They didn't have the nerve to tell me that she was already dead because they didn't know how I was going to react. And I was in another city trying to graduate from high school. So I missed my graduation. She died on the same day. And that same day, my life turned around 100%. Like my only supporter has left, you know, the world. So I was pretty much on my own since then. That's really hard. Yeah, that was really hard. That was really hard for a lot of things physically because I didn't have anybody that, well, I had my mom's family that, you know, embraced me. However, it's not the same, you know, it's not the same feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom and I had our things like we used to go do our things together and we just didn't have that anymore. And my father wasn't around at the time. So it was really hard there as well because when that happened, you know, he had the opportunity to come in. Mm -hmm. But it was really mentally challenging because it was more of a manipulation game. You know, like now that she died, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I just didn't want to be in that position at mm -hmm. the age of 16, having to have these conversations. It was very overwhelming. Yeah, I can only imagine. Prior to your mom passing, what had you been planning to do after high school? And 16 is really early to graduate from high school. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Really early. Yeah. I was planning to, you know, just a normal life. I mean, my mother always had the dream to come to California and live here. That was her dream. Her dream was to, she had her own finance company in Honduras. She was a financier. So her dream was to put a retail shop in California. That was her dream. And we were going to go to California once I graduated high school and put me into school there. I wanted a career in marketing you know, marketing was my head was at, but I'm really good with numbers. I mean, I study a little bit of marketing when I went to college in Honduras. For I went to college for a period of time and I did a little bit of marketing and I took mm -hmm. some programming classes and I was with engineers in these programming classes and I was basically teaching them how to do programming. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm really good at this. Right, right. But I'm taking the other route. But yeah, that's what we were intending to do. I mean, somehow I ended up in California Many, many, many years later, following, I guess, her dream, mm -hmm. somehow I just came here following my heart. And I guess she just, you know, I feel like she's with me. So I think that she kind of led me here throughout the years. And so. is that what was the catalyst for you leaving Honduras and coming to the States? So it was a lot of circumstances, one happening after another. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of conflict internal within the families. I felt like I was being a challenge, you know, like it's a kind of like you're giving away to a family that they didn't expect you, right? So I felt like I was being a burden at some point, even though that was my family and they would really try to accommodate me. I just felt that way. And it was probably because, you know, it was my whole life changed, my whole lifestyle changed. You know, I w didn't have my room anymore. I didn't do the same things that I used to do. I had to change cities. So it was a lot of different circumstances that led me to that decision. And I did it in a way that was very hurtful as well. I told my family I was going to go shopping to Miami because at the age of 17, you'd really need a guardian to travel with you in Honduras. You're not, and you know, you're not over age and you're not independent until 21. So you need somebody mm -hmm. until 21, not 18. So I come here and I said, well, I'm going to go shopping. Can you please sign my papers? And that's what they did. And I just never came back. So I just stayed How old here. were you when you went shopping and didn't come back? <laughs> I really didn't go shopping. I went to Miami. I was 17 at the time. And wow. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that scary? I never thought it was scary. No, I thought staying there was scary. I thought if I stay in Honduras, it's scary to me. I didn't okay. see a life there. Yeah. So you get the paper signed. You tell a little fib. You go to Miami. Yes. You, I presume, don't know anybody. 
So at the time, because I graduated with a few high school friends, they were already at the time studying in a college. Okay. So I reached out to one and I had my savings. The moment that my mother died, I started working. I started working like, you know, just doing like little jobs here and there, nothing professional, just whatever I could create some money off. And I had savings. So yeah, so I connected with my friends and they said, why don't you just come to this apartment complex where there's a lot of college students, you know, like those college students, apartment complexes, you get a roommate. I'm like, okay, that sounds fun. I mean, rent in Florida at that time was like $400. So <laughs> <laughs> oh my not anymore but no <laughs> yeah so I did that that was my first leg into something yeah and I had them there and then I enrolled myself into college and this one thing took to another you know I got myself a job I dated somebody he co-signed for my first car thank goodness for his heart but he didn't think I was gonna default in the loan he actually helped me out because I was taking the bus back and forth. So just throughout the years, you know, life was good to me as I was, you know, putting it together. Well, it sounds like you're very comfortable taking risks and asking for help also. But I still, I can't imagine being so young, leaving the country, being in a new country, not knowing what your next steps were going to be outside of come to this apartment complex. Yes, it was very, I didn't have a plan of action. I just knew I was going to figure it out. That was my main thought I had. I'm going to figure it out. I never thought, what if something goes wrong? Like that never came to my mind ever. I was never that person that said, well, if something goes wrong, I'll go back home. I never took that as a plan B ever. I just thought, you know, I'm here. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get a job and I'm going to make this happen for myself. That's what kept me going. I mean, there was times that were really hard. I had to cry a lot to financial aid because, I mean, they were not giving me a lot of grants or loans. And I just cried. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have their families. I basically emancipated myself. Mm -hmm. So they gave me more money being in that office crying almost every semester. (laughs) I became... It worked. <laughs> it worked. I mean, it was very genuine. I became friends with the financial aid, I guess, agents, their mm-hmm. officers. And I gave them, like, we had pizza together a few times. We had cookies. Like, we made, like, this whole... Because, you know, it was true. It was very genuine. I really needed that support from someone. And right. they were there to support us so that I lean into them. And because of them, I'm like, I'm so grateful for them. But they gave me a little bit more of help. I was able to come, you know, to survive, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like that mindset of you're just going to figure it out, everything will fill in from there was something that you were born with or is that from your mom or like a lot of people let stuff stop them? Yes, that's a good question. So my mother always taught me to fight for everything that I want in life. She even said, you, if somebody bullies you, you fight back. And my father was like, no, you don't fight back. (laughs) You fight with kindness. So I had both of those, you know, equations. Uh Good advice is both ways. But my mother always taught me, you know, if you're out there in this world, you got to fight for everything that you want. And I never fought for anything my whole life. I was very spoiled, actually. I was an only child. I had my mother gave me everything that I wanted, everything. So I was a pretty spoiled person. So to take that decision as that meeting that personality back then really is impressive to me now because somebody that's spoiled and that is depending on so many things to be given to that person, they don't really just take off. But it was really something internal inside of me that was urging me to get away from the negativity. It felt like a cloud. I was feeling Mm -hmm. depressed. It was really affecting my well-being. And I just wanted some peace in my life because there was so much going on. So I think that is the part that kept me moving forward. I was leaning into that feeling a lot to not have that fear of going back to say, I'm going to figure it out. I just don't care anymore. I'm going to figure it out because I know life there and I don't want to be there. And I just want a life somewhere else. So I don't think it was I was born with it. And I don't think it was something that they breed me to it through those 16 years because I was so spoiled. Mm -hmm. But it was definitely something that life brought out of me. Just, you know, you you either make a choice, either use get comfortable in that position and you just stay there and, you know, or you make something out of your life. And that's where I had to make a big decision and stick to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and clearly you did. So. And clearly <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> so you're in Miami, you're in college, 
fill in the gaps between there a little bit and starting your business. Yeah. So I graduated from there. I went to Virginia. I've been all over the place, by the way. I've lived in Miami, Orlando. Yes. You have given me some really good perspective. Mm -hmm. And actually has made me really people smart because of that, because we just meet so many different personalities. But I've lived in Miami, Orlando. I lived in Virginia, Washington, D.C. And then I am here in New York. I had a time Mm -hmm. in New York. And then I went and now I'm here in California. So between all of that route, I met somebody and I got engaged and I went to Virginia with that person and I finished my degree there. I went to George Mason. I studied finance, but that, you know, disappeared. It was not meant to be. So I just continued pursuing my degree and I didn't think I was able to do it in Florida because Florida is, I don't know if you ever lived in Florida, Emmy, but Florida is a kind of state that is too much partying. Yes. That has been my experience when I have visited, Yes, particularly in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. Yes. Uh, Yes. Correct. Great for vacation. (laughs) So it's a great vacation spot. Oh my goodness. There is no vacation there. You need a vacation after Florida. But But I actually am very grateful that I met my fiance and I was able to move to Virginia because I couldn't finish a degree in Florida. It was impossible. It took a lot of my, I mean, I was really young. It took a lot of my good years. I was partying and having the time of my life. And when I, you know, when I got the opportunity with him to move to Virginia, I took it a hundred percent because this is my chance to get out of here and like really focus on my career. And I did that. Yeah. So Virginia was like an escape plan for me for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And from there, I studied my finance degree. I graduated and I took a job in, you know, a financial company around the same time 2008 where everything economy crashed I moved to New York that didn't work out because markets were horrible so I did like other yeah it was awful it was like the worst time to graduate on finance I don't even know so and there was no job so I took like other you know like side jobs things to to make me survive in New York because New York is a very very expensive place has always been expensive so you always have to work around the clock to make a good living out of there So I did that. And then I got tired of working. Like I was really chasing my tail in New York. And I went back to Virginia. And that's when I got another opportunity where the very successful top 20 CPA firm. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this because it's very stable. It seems like business, you know, like having a lot of business finance is a good stability career. So I did that. I started, they groomed me. I mean, they love me. I was a top performer there. And from there on, I kind of, you know, molded my life the way I wanted it to be. I was there for a few years. I did a lot of remote work and it was for a lot of consulting companies like restaurants, nonprofits, a lot of different industries. They were not exciting to me. But one day I said, okay, well, I'm going to be 31 day and it's coming up really quickly really soon. So uh, I am going to move to California. And I've never been in California. Like I've never visited in California. I don't even know what's in California. But I said, you know, (laughs) yeah, but I was so tired of the cold weather. I mean, I was tired Uh. of the snow. (laughs) Coming from Honduras with the tropical weather, you know, sunny all the time, maybe rain when it's winter, the snow was getting to me and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I said, well, I'm not going back to Florida because it's not the place for me. Mm-hmm. I did that, been there, need to move on. So I said, I'm going to move to California. And I didn't know California. So I went ahead and I told, I didn't tell my company at the time. I said, okay, I'm just going to move. I'm going to transfer my lease. That I said, well, okay, let's see where my apartment complex has a sister apartment complex. So I did that. I transferred the lease over. I ended up in Newport Beach, Orange County, out of all the places. I didn't mm-hmm. even know what that's going to be like. But I said, this sounds good. It's near the beach. This is great. It's going to do it. Rent is good. Okay. And then I just moved. And my company didn't even know I moved. I just moved. I didn't tell them. One day I get a message from the principal saying, Alejandra, I haven't seen you in any of the meetings. I'm like, yeah, no, I've been remote. She's like, yeah, I know. But you haven't come in at all for the last three months. I'm like, yeah, well, I moved to California. But I've been doing work from California. That's <laughs> what so she was like, what's going on? I'm like, I can help you guys open an office here. (laughs) And she just, she was very in shock, but she accommodated me. So she was like, okay. So nobody had noticed that you, for three months, that you hadn't actually physically been in the office. No. And this was like 2008, 2009. 
Oh, no. This was back in like 2014. Okay. Mm. But still, pre-COVID, before yeah. like virtual working and remote working for big corporations was a thing. It was a thing. Yeah. I was already, it was, I was already doing that remote working back in 2010, 2011. I was already yeah. doing it. Yeah. So they didn't notice I was gone. No. So just, and they didn't fire you. No, they did not. I was a top performer. So they did not fire me. They accommodated me. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So you are totally living the kind of not do what you want, but beg for forgiveness later if necessary. <laughs> yes. Instead yes, of asking for permission. <laughs> yes. Because I know if I ask, you're going to say no. So, I mean, it is not the best way to do things, but it was the way I did it. I did, you know, my transition. California, I definitely love California. It really is the place for me. I'm very grateful that I did this big decision. Mm -hmm. Because I definitely feel like there is a lot of spiritual spirituality and well-being that like you people focus more on those items. And it's really important for me to have like well-being in my health, you know, physical, mental. And, you know, one thing led to another. So then after that, I went to a consulting company for entrepreneurs here in California. That's when I break into entrepreneurship because it was when I landed here that I really was exposed to entrepreneurship because back in... Okay. The East Coast, there was not really that much entrepreneurship happening around 2010, 11. There's always going to be some, but not to the level that we are right now. Right, 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 right. So then I was very exposed to VC okay. and, you know, what entrepreneurs do and what is, you know, how startups operate. So very exposed through this consulting company. And that's when I realized, you know, I just felt so bad. I felt like my heart was in pain and fire because I just saw these entrepreneurs building their businesses with their sweat, you know, working so many hours and companies like them charging them over 10K, 15K a month mm -hmm. for something that's not even a good product. So that's when I said, you know, this sucks. I want to do something different. Like, that this really burns me. And then I went to like internal employee for startups and I, I loved it. I saw another perspective. I'm like, oh, now. so I saw the consulting side and now I see the employee side. Wow, this is so different. Like what an actual company needs. And then that's when I created my company. I said, it's time for me to do my own thing. Yeah. 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 And that's what we stand by. That's why, because of my experience, the values of the startup tandem team are very set on being very transparent mm -hmm. and honest with clients. And just kind of like change a little bit of that industry. Yeah. So how does Startup Tandem help its clients? Yeah. So good question. So I personally love early stage companies just because you can help them from the very beginning, creating the infrastructure, you know, that's clean and that prevents them from like lawsuits, right? Because there's mm -hmm. when you start a business, you're prone to a lot of lawsuits. So you are not even familiarized with like hiring the wrong employee, terminating them the wrong way onboarding, you know, like just saying something that's raw in California. If you're in California, you are a target for lawsuits as an employer. That's just how it is because California is very lean to employees. Also, I like how to stay compliant. Like if you hire now that there is so much remote work, if you hire employees in other states, like what kind of compliance do you have to meet? Like your accounting, for example, a lot of these entrepreneurs don't even do financials until maybe year three or year four. And everything mm -hmm. is through, right? This bank statements and credit card statements. Yeah. Yeah. Bookkeeping in general. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. So a lot of what I do is educational. When I have a conversation with somebody that's saying, hey, I want to know about your services. I educate them a lot. Like, yes, this is cheaper. At the end of the day, you're going to end up paying more money because you're taking the cheap route. Mm -hmm. So let me just start from the beginning and we create like an infrastructure at whatever budget, you know, we go by our business matter. We will meet you wherever you're at in your business journey. We're very, very set on that. We'll definitely meet you there. But with the intention of creating an infrastructure of policies, processes that will yeah. keep from the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we do it. We have an HR side consulting where, you know, my teammate, Carlene and colleague, she leads those efforts. She has a lot of experience in that area. So she helps companies at a, from an early stage set up their whole employee handbook and just kind of be compliant on that area, payroll. And then we have <laughs> the finance accounting side and the tax side that I lead along with other colleagues as well. So all of the finance and like kind of operational HR people aspects that 
at least in my experience, a lot of entrepreneurs don't think through until they're in the middle of it. Correct. Uh, and yeah. for you, once people are, maybe it's not all complete, but in the process of creating those and looking at their financials, what happens for them? So we get people from different stages. So we get the ones that need a lot of cleanups, right? Like they've never done anything in their life and they have a QuickBooks platform and they said, I've never done anything. Somebody came in, posted some transactions and that's it. And we're like, oh, great. Let's do some work. (laughs) So we have a few of those. Actually, those are the majority of the clients that come in to us and we kind of like set them up. And then we have a lot of the clients that come in and they say, hey, okay, let's start from the very beginning, like the way I told you. And then we have clients that have been a victims of, of the industry, you know, of those other consulting companies that are billing them $20,000. And, you know, they come to us and they say, I know that I shouldn't be paying this much money for the service. And I say, yeah, you're right. This is 100% outrageous to me. I don't even know how you're paying that. Right. And, you know, it's very sad, though, because those clients are already hurt and those clients are defensive. So Mm -hmm. it's really hard to build a trust again, and it takes a lot of time. So that my goal is to save everybody from those companies. My goal. (laughs) (laughs) That's my goal, Amy. I swear. Just because it makes me so mad. The other day, I had this conversation. I'm not going to say with who, but there's this company that is telling people in my field, oh, yes, you can make this much money and reach this much targeting revenue goals. And I said, okay, I'm going to sit down on this conversation to see how they do it. And yes, of course, they're telling them to charge a percentage of revenue for services. I'm like sitting here thinking, how am I going to charge 5% of your revenue for something that is 500 bucks? You got to be kidding. Come on, guys. Right. I cannot do that to people. (laughs) Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about, like they set revenue goals arbitrarily about what they would like to make without the marketing and the pipeline that they need to fill in that revenue. Yes. Yes. This is true. Yeah. Having that help and that assistance then is really beneficial. So then they're creating more realistic goals too. Correct. So a lot of what we do, I always tell them, you know, when you walk forward, do you close your eyes or do you walk with your eyes open? Because that's exactly what you're doing with your business. If you're going forward, are you closing your eyes and blindly just moving forward? Or are you really strategically knowing what you're doing? Because that right there will make you or break your business 100%. And a lot of what we do is educating entrepreneurs and business owners, helping them understand that you do need forecasts that you do need to be on top of your cash. Cash is king. You need to be on top of it. But in Mm -hmm. order to be on top of it, you need to know where you're heading and how you're getting there. And a lot of people, a lot of business owners do not know this because, you know, when you do a company, you have a a certain skill set. You don't need to know this kind of thing. These are not your things to know, but these are your things to be partnering up with somebody that knows from the very beginning. Well, and at least in my experience, most business owners aren't starting a business because they're like, oh, yay, I want to be able to read financial projections. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and I want to do accounting and I want to be in compliant with all or no. with all. <laughs> right? Like they're excited about the thing that they either sell from a product standpoint or the service they have. <laughs> And that's what we're here for because, you know, they need to be focused on their own trade and we need to focus on our trade. Yeah. Right, right. Well, and it sounds like you're a believer similar to I am where do the thing that you're great at and then build the team, support team around you to help you do the stuff that you're less fantastic at. Correct. A hundred percent. I tell everybody in my team, listen, guys, I don't, I am not an expert in everything because if I want. If I was, <laughs> I would be a genius somewhere else. I am not. I am not pretending here that I am. I am good at a lot of the things that I do. But for example, HR, I'm not going to sit down there and pretend that I know all of the HR regulations because I don't. I have somebody that helps me with that and helps everybody with that. Right. Or, I mean, you know, I bring somebody that has a lot of experience in nonprofits. I have that experience, but I really want you to own that experience, to hone mm-hmm. into that. Right. Because I, you know, I have a lot of skill sets and I have a lot of knowledge and I love to research and I'm a nerd. So I love to study. So I'm always actualizing myself. But your team is the one that makes you the best. You, you the team. I always say Startup Tandem is not Alejandra. It's my team. I'm always talking about them because that's the company's what that is. Right. I'm just the face. I'm just the owner, the founder, the CEO, but I'm not all of it. Right. 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 
What do you feel like is the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs face right now? In terms of what area? Because there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> All of it, no. And let's go with in growing, like getting kind of out of that startup phase and into a place of being relatively sustainable. Yeah, so depending on the industry. So for example, like the CPG industry right now, with everything that's going on in the economy, I think your business model, like it goes back to having what business model you have, right? Mm -hmm. Like if your business, if you're bringing product from other countries, do you have, do you understand what that's going to do with your cash, logistics, expenses, right? Are you going to be able to, marketing is another big one, right? Obviously Mm -hmm. marketing. There's so many frogs out there that are doing marketing that they tell you and they sell you and they say, oh, I'm going to bring you this and that and make you so much money. And they don't. And, you know, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs making the mistake. Well, the one of they go for fundraising round and they say, well, these funds are going to be to hire a full marketing team. And each marketing person is going to be making 70,000, 100,000. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, guys. And I'm not thinking. I'm telling them this is not good use of the funds. Like we need to be very smart with how we're going to allocate these funds. So there is a lot of mistakes that people are doing out there. Marketing, creating a business model that, you know, makes it more challenging in the future to create that revenue. So for example, you're bringing product from another country. Like, have you thought about how that's going to affect your inventory turnover? Are you going to have inventory at hand whenever, you know, available because of shipment problems that's going on? So like, you just have to think ahead and As an entrepreneur, if you're going to create a business, make it easy for yourself. Make it simple. Simple is best. Whatever makes sense, simple in your business industry, that's where you need to go. You don't go complexity and research the industry because I had a lot of people that don't research their industry. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we are in a very, this industry is only survived by people buying other companies. So that's the only way I see this, you know, being successful. Research the industry, research your marketing team, make sure you're not allocating funds inappropriately just to pay salaries. To me, that's a burn of cash. Cash should be allocated to revenue generating activities when you're, especially when you're young, revenue generating activities. Yeah. Not for overhead. Well, and I like what you said about keeping it simple because what I see a lot of entrepreneurs do because they're great at creating stuff and they've got this huge vision is they're offering too many different things that they haven't allowed any one of those things to kind of come into its full cycle so that it's sort of automated. Um, Agreed. Agreed. I think that testing the water, the industry with one product is the best way to go. And then from there, create new ones, right? And then you'll see why you have the demand works. What is the response? Right. Right, right. I really do agree with that. Simple is best marketing dollars. Sometimes I think that it's great for entrepreneurs to own their marketing, you know, mm-hmm. to own their ads, to learn how to do a Google ad campaign and what worked for them and what, you know, what were the KPIs. That way, when there's a marketing person coming in, you know how to make the right questions. Right. Yeah. You know what to look for. Yeah. And, and I think that's the other thing I see is there's one of two areas a lot of business owners kind of fall into where They start taking all these DIY courses, trying to learn everything where they want to do none of it. And for me, the happy medium is, particularly with some of the marketing aspects, is learn enough to be able to have smart conversations and then delegate it so you can have a marketing team. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Because as the owner and the founder, your job is to be visioning, leading, growing, not in the weeds. Not in the weeds. Yeah. We're yeah. always in the weeds on the startup world. I think everybody in the, well, most of them yeah. are. Yeah. You just have to be very smart with your time. Like I always say, I tell my team, I'm focusing on revenue generating activity, guys. That's my job. <laughs> Bring the money. <laughs> I want to ask a couple of questions about your team because I saw on your website, you have a chief snuggles off- officer named Bro. I do have a chief snuggles officer. Where are you, bro? Uh, he's adorable. Thank you. Yes, he's the mascot of the team. He's been with me for 10 years, so. Is he a pug? He's a dog. I guess. He's a puggle. It's a, a pug and a beagle oh, mix. Okay. Yes. Wow. Wow. So does everybody get to hang out with him? When we get together, I bring him in a few gatherings. We usually, we do team building events once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, so because we're very remote, everybody's remote. A few folks in California, a few folks in Florida, one person in New York. So we're all over the scattered. So we try to do team building events at least once a month. And when the team building event is dog friendly, I, I will bring him along. Yes. 
<laughs> I think that's wonderful. I had two dogs and one of them, he seemed to know whenever I was going to be on Zoom. And that was when he demanded that he sit in my lap. That he would Zoom oh. bomb most of my meetings and many of the podcast recordings. I love it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank God he was tiny too. and Not like a giant Great Dane or something. <laughs> that would be a little more challenging. <laughs> Hello, Alejandra. This has been such a great conversation. I'm curious, as we're recording this the end of 2022, what is on the horizon for you in 2023? So 2023 is going to be a very busy, busy year for us. We are creating a few internal programs that are going to be targeting enterprises. So that would be one of the things that we're going to be launching next year. And it's basically Mm -hmm. on how to improve companies' culture. We're very huge in culture. I think that American companies need to make changes. I mean, we are growing, we as human beings are evolving. So therefore companies need to start evolving as well. So we're creating this program. We're going to be pitching it. We're going to be selling it. And with that, we're going to be also scaling our team. Mm -hmm. I'm a very firm believer of having still a very boutique agency. I think that's going to be always the feel of my company. I love that my clients text me at any time. Honestly, I'm a workaholic. So you can find me at any time. If I'm awake, I will answer right away. (laughs) (laughs) So I love that. I have a team that supports me, but my clients is like, hey, Alejandro, did you get this? Very, very casual. I love that atmosphere of casuality. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue having that agency feel, but still scale. I have plans to move a little bit of our services to other places like Canada. So that's something that has been in my foreseeable future. I would like to be some starting next year, but maybe at the end of Q4, because we have to focus on other things first. Right, right. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of fun things planned and many different ways to expand too. This is the beauty of, you know, having your own business. You can, you're, you, you make the rules so you can go wherever yeah. you want, however you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and your excitement for what you're doing comes through. So I wouldn't necessarily describe you as a workaholic, but definitely an enthusiastic entrepreneur. I love what I do. I love my moments. So for example, I have long days. Every day is long. I just had breakfast a few hours ago and it's 2 p.m. right now. So it's, you know, my days are long and I'm okay with that because having a conversation with my clients that tell me, this is great. This gives me so much feedback. This is what I needed. Those conversations right there just makes it my whole day get better. It's a sunny day for me just because I had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So those conversations are the ones that drive me up every day. And those conversations are the ones that just propel me forward. I Yeah, that's what makes me happy, honestly. Making people successful and helping them in their journey is really, really what fulfills me. I love that. I love that. Share with everybody where they can find you. You can find me everywhere. Literally, we're everywhere. We are on LinkedIn, Startup Tandem. I am also there as Alejandra Santos. We have an IG, a Facebook page. We also have a Twitter page. We're not very active on Twitter. We probably will need to start doing that more often. And we are on YouTube as well. We are on TikTok. <laughs> Fantastic. I am not. (laughs) (laughs) That's actually one of the things I want to improve next year is continue creating content. I love creating content in a way that's fun, you know, I think because what I do is educational. So how can I educate everybody in a fun way? And I am a fun person. So I want my fun personality to shine through my content. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Well, then it's more interesting and engaging. Yes. I'll have to check out your Instagram. And if I get on TikTok, but I feel I'm mostly on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. So we are very active on LinkedIn. That's our main channel. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. But the reels just in general crack me up and the dog ones in particular. But (laughs) (laughs) I have a reel with my chief snuggles where I am. It's really funny. I put a music on and I put him a rapper song and we were just like rapping some like number music and he's so cute he's like why are you he puts his face like why are you doing this to me i don't like yeah yeah now does he have his own instagram handle (laughs) not yet not yet there's so many channels to manage that i cannot manage one more but one day probably yes (laughs) awesome (laughs) well thank you so much for being on the show i appreciate it no thank you emmy thank you for the opportunity yeah 
It's my hope that you find at least one nugget of value in each episode of Women Who Build Empires. And if that's true, please follow and share Women Who Build Empires with your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcast. Your support is what will help this podcast be found by more women just like you. Thank you.